Do you feel like all the money that you've saved up is just evaporating before your very own eyes? Do you know what I do when I have these crises? I drink coffee brand coffee. Coffee brand coffee gives me the confidence that everything is going to be a-okay someday. If you want 5% off your entire coffee or tea order, enter code Honey and Absinthe at checkout at the link down below. And enjoy your coffee. Enjoy your coffee and my babies. This episode is made possible by New Masters Academy, the world's absolute number one art school in the entire world. Click the link down below for a free seven-day trial. Thank you, New Masters Academy. I am deep in the annals of your mind. I am deep in the annals of your... Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Honey and Absinthe After Hours podcast. We are your hosts. I'm Vincent, a background designer, yet again for the Hollywood animation industry. And I'm Janet, the ex-Disney artist turned independent creator, and this is a podcast about all things art, business, and, and whatever we feel like. like. Now today, today we're going to talk about the real reason why millennials are childless. No one talks about this. But before we get into it, make sure to touch my buttons. Please, touch the like and subscribe button. Help this channel out. Let's get to monetization on this channel. Oh, yes. Let's do it. Let's get there. Subscribe. Click the thumbs up. If you're on Spotify, good to see you. Click on that subscribe, whatever, follow whatever. button. Yeah. And uh, good to see you yet again. We are now in March. We have passed daylight savings time. It has been hard to adjust, at least for us. Yes. Uh, we hope you are doing well. Hey, look at you with you the hair. Great. They look great. It's you look spring. great. It's spring. It's spring, everybody. Finally. <laughs> Hopefully it's warm where you are at. And you look great. Break out those florals. And I don't know. You look happy. You look nice. I think so, too. So, Janet, why aren't people like us having babies anymore? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So... I've been noticing, for whatever reason, on social media, people have been talking about childless millennials, a.k.a. DINKS. It, DINKS? Yes. It's an acronym. I forget exactly what the each letter stands for, but basically it represents dual income like households, essentially. Like, you work, I work, and we both benefit from our dual incomes without having children um the conversation around this online lately has been two camps and people aren't very subtle on social media so on one on one side it's people criticizing these dinks <laughs> this sounds we like, are dinks. Yes. I guess we are dinks. Yes. I, a lot of yeah. our peers are, are dinks. dinks. Yeah. This sounds like a derogatory term, but like it, it just is. Um, a lot of people who are really into having children and being all about like telling you you should have children. Um, they they there's a lot of fakery in the vlogging family space where when you make social media content around ha being in a successful relationship and having children and having a successful family vlog or whatever, um, there's a lot of money involved and pressure to basically just say, this is amazing, you should have children too. Or they're the Jordan Petersons of the world who like shame you and criticize you, you have to have for children. yeah for you have being to have children. a bad person for uh, for wanting children for not having children. You're a bad person if you don't have children. <laughs> um, and then because of the intensity of the that type of content, this type of content, there's a reactionary side where the dinks make content about, oh, isn't it great that we're like 40, we're millennials, and we have dual income, we don't have children, oh my god, it's so great, I get to like go on vacation. We can and go to Bora Bora <laughs> where, whenever, whenever we want. And both of these things are just trying like they're criticizing each other 
<laughs> the dinks are as a reaction trying to be like stop criticizing my life choices and then rubbing it in your face being like oh look how great my life is and then on the other side they're they're just mad that i don't know i don't really know why other people are mad that people are deciding not to have well, children declining birth rates as jordan peterson says <sighs> we are turning into japan yeah so i recently i don't know why i've been i was recommended jordan peterson's i don't know what it is a podcast um where he was talking about like declining birth rates and why are millennials childless and um as someone who's very so my opinion about all of this is just the <laughs> this is a personal decision and it's a complicated decision and it's weird for either side to be telling me to have or not have children. <laughs> I'm not going to have children for the sake of society, man. Society can eat it. Yeah, so, uh, like, Jordan Peterson's whole shtick is, like, for the... <laughs> well, one, biologically, you're going to regret it. Two, uh, there are declining birth rates. Um, apparently, it's very behind the times to say that um, we are increasing in the amount of people. It's actually more accurate to be worried about declining birth rates. But then he uses that as some kind of excuse to shame you into having children because you're not doing your your due your, your duty to society if you're not having children because it, it, it and he describes this. Um, <laughs> dystopian world where everyone is old and no one can take care of them <laughs> and i i just it's just so ridiculous to me their main criticism for, for childless millennials is that you're being selfish you're being selfish for not wanting children and i go like both sides are self that the act of not wanting or wanting children is selfish inherently <laughs> There's no, like, I want children. The I want part is selfish, no matter what reason for wanting. No one is fucking going, I'm going to have children for the sake of society. No one does that. Yeah. Okay. I mean, like, <laughs> like, who, who, like, no, no, no one's saying that is my sole reason. Like, Imagine telling your child, I didn't actually want you, but for I did this, it for society. Yeah. <laughs> I did it because Jordan Peterson told me to have children. Uh, usually people have children because um, parental um, pressure, um, uh, just the fantasy of being a mother or a father or, or whatever. And, and that has been kind of the standard for a long time. And now us <laughs> millennials are being called selfish because uh, we want to keep the money we make <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and, and we want to re just save money and retire. We don't really find a uh, need or find space for for to have a child, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know. I I keep thinking, well, it could be right, but like just because I have a kid doesn't mean they're gonna fucking take care of me yeah. at the end of my life. Nor would I think I would want them to yeah. live your life, leave me behind. A lot of the um, basic comments I see underneath these types of like Jordan Peterson videos. Usually, it's, you know, people are in their own echo chambers, so people who like Dink content, they tend to be leftists. People who like Jordan Peterson tend to be right-leaning. So uh, Jordan, Jordan Peterson's telling me to have babies. I think she should probably have babies. Yes, but, but it's a lot of, like, um, making fun of millennials mm. on, on under the Jordan Peterson type content and they typically say things like oh so like these women are are so um like they're gonna be lonely one day they're gonna be um they're gonna like boy will it be a sad time when they're in their they're dying and no one's gonna be taking care of them and i go like bitch <laughs> try living where we're living and you'll see the reality of what people's children actually do for them and i'll be like okay uh so you're gonna have children so they're gonna be free labor for you to take care of your old ass <laughs> okay but like there's gonna be i think the 
the old people needing to be taken care of is separate from the issue of like having children because I think it's cruel to have children just to force them to, to take like, care of your old ass, you, man. Or to be taxpayers, or what, what yeah. the fuck? Like, what? Um, it's just it's just a strange... Like, I, I also think these people are probably in their 30s, 40s, 50s, who also don't have a real, like, grasp of what it means to be old. And I just think everyone is delusional. <laughs> everyone. Um, but there's a side of this that no one is really talking about. Like, the real reason why millennials aren't having children, I don't necessarily think is um, selfish. Uh, Because I don't, I actually think a lot of millennials want children, but we're postponing having them. Um, And then this leads me to, like, this other trend that people have been talking about. Um... I saw this TikTok of this person reacting to, I think, a a news article, actually. It must have been, like, a Washington Post article talking about how millennials aren't, are hitting their mid-life, essentially. The older millennials, um, at this point, are, like... We are cusp millennials. Yes. We're very bottom. But the older millennials are, what, 40 Yeah, 40, probably starting to reach 45, to an older um so hitting that like 45 50 age we're starting to get there um not us because we're we're closer to like gen z honestly in like the way we think the way we act everything but the older millennials um they interviewed a bunch of them and they asked them like do you feel like you're in your midlife thing do you think do you feel like you're going to even have a a tip a typical in quotes midlife crisis meaning you know what you imagine in the movies like you have an affair you have enough money to to buy a fancy sports car you you have kids and yeah Yeah. (laughs) um you have a house you want to divorce all all these things um you want to do your eat pray love journey (laughs) yeah now that your kids have flown the coop and gone to college or something um, and basically, in the article, a lot of these millennials who are hitting mid-age are like, I, well, in health-wise, I, yes, I feel mid-age, but financially, no. Economically, I don't, I don't feel like I, I've been fighting for survival for my entire fucking life, and... I don't can't even imagine retiring. I can't even imagine having the kind of disposable income to like buy a sports car, <laughs> like the things that typically come with a midlife crisis. So this TikTok basically was basically complaining, and then in the comments, people were complaining about how um, we millennials aren't going to experience that the same way maybe the boomers did or the Xers did. Or, or whatever. Um, and unfortunately, I, I feel like this ends up being kind of like a pity party for millennials when they start talking about this stuff and they start complaining about boomers specifically. They complain that they're hoarding wealth. They bought all the that, houses. Yeah, that like um, they've, they fucked it up for us right. and we have to like fix everything for them. Um, and in general, I'm not sure I believe all of this. It feels very fear mongering and it feels very like dooms, doom, dooms, like, oh, the sky is falling. And I think what, what I realize the more I'm watching social media and I'm watching specifically millennials and Gen Z kind of react to the state of the world currently, which is just, if you haven't heard, <laughs> banks are failing. <laughs> and it's kind of like... Two bottles of sriracha's $25, man. Yeah. Our elderly cat food jumped from $25 to $35, man. <laughs> and Jordan Peterson's Canadian ass wants us to have kids, man. <laughs> Come on, man. Yes. I can barely feed my cat, man. <laughs> For real. Jeez. We can barely feed our fur babies. Um, which apparently the right also cringes when we say shit like that. Like, oh, they're not your fur babies, they're animals. Um, 
I don't like the term fur babies. <laughs> Me neither. I don't use it actually. Um, I think the real reason we millennials and Gen Z are behaving the way we are is a response to money anxiety. I think we are reaching adulthood or have reached adulthood and we have money anxiety and I think it's really normal for someone who's transitioning from being a child essentially like a teenager to adulthood in this 20s to 40s age I think it's very normal to experience money anxiety and eventually you get over it if you're like my dad you don't get over it till you retire <laughs> but you should eventually get over it but i think right now what's happening what we're seeing with millennials postponing having children and um millennials complaining about the boomers and the gen z complaining about the boomers everyone just conveniently ignores <laughs> the xers who are who they're actually complaining about but they're complaining and i think they're actually well, just, i thought we're, i thought everybody's supposed to be blaming the boomers the boomers are like what in their 70s at this point <laughs> 70s 80s they're like they are in the twilight with no more fucks to give yes they're <laughs> old they're reti- they're well into retirement a lot of them are dying on like <laughs> a lot of them are dying honestly um i i think money anxiety is the real cause of a lot of this stuff i think a lot of millennials do want children um and but like we're it doesn't feel like we can um like we it doesn't feel like we can barely take care of ourselves financially we can barely take care of our 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 animals um and then now you want like the idea of we can barely afford homes we can barely afford cars <laughs> the, the people who have careers i think can um but i think the majority of millennials actually still can't um it's and then you want to throw in having children so this is what i'm i, I what i found out from tiktok okay this is crazy to me because i didn't know this before like i've never really wanted kids but like this on top of this added to my anxiety about money and i just now i'm like no um to have a child is ex- like to give birth to a child to bring a life into the world the act of pushing birthing. yeah birthing a child out of your body is extremely expensive um so one of the people that uh i am peripherally aware of online um they had this couple had a a child um they came up in tiktok with us essentially and this couple had a child and they were very open about uh the whole process and they shared a crazy tiktok where they said you know they understood that like you know rearing a child and bringing like having them go to college all that stuff very expensive they didn't realize how fucking expensive it is to just birth a child and they were like we have health care they were like we have health care and it was still expensive we have health care we have health care um still still it's makes going sense. to be expensive yeah and so they they said um the health care basically covered his wife's um hospital stay for the most part other than like you know the copay the bare minimum you have to pay in order to give birth but it doesn't cover your newborn human (laughs) so how much is the price tag of the newborn human so the price tag of the newborn human to have their hospital stay was about ten thousand dollars minimum like this was just like the and there's nothing wrong with the baby too like imagine imagine some you had a preemie or 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 some kind of something went wrong it would be even more expensive apparently getting an epidural adds to the price apparently getting a c-section adds to the price if you decide you want that i had no idea of this too <laughs> yeah, i was like and he was like this is the first bill like there are more bills coming God, <laughs> and i was like and this is with health insurance in the United States. So I, I was, because I learned about this information on TikTok, I was like, who knows if this is 
correct. So I Googled it. I looked it up. And oh my God, it's even worse than I thought. If you don't have health insurance, the cost of giving a baby and giving birth to a baby vaginally is about eighteen thousand oh, dollars. And a C section is twenty six thousand oh, dollars. And I don't actually know the date of when w- in this this article is for the article. Uh they didn't say. Uh, yeah. uh, okay. Um but like like I imagine with inflation, I don't because I don't know when this article was written, <laughs> this Forbes article. <laughs> it's probably more expensive today. So I was just like, oh "That's God. a car. That's a down payment on a house." <laughs> and that's just the beginning. This is just <laughs> the beginning of your that's payments, before man. Any education. The but, crib. This is like yeah. the simple <laughs> baby formula. The crib. The bottle. Everything. The vaccines. The 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 baby food. Yeah, man. Everything. And the, I was like, "Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god!" <laughs> Like, and you want me to, you want to force me to have children for the good of society? Fuck society. My God. <laughs> I don't want to be debt for the rest. And this is, a, that's a car payment. I, I, it gave like advice on how to afford it. It was like, well, you can have, you can break it up into installments. You can be broke and have the taxpayers pay it and fund it. You just can, basically um, just get into debt. It's no big yeah, deal. Yeah, no big deal. Just get into debt. And I'm like, that's literally a car payment. That's <laughs> <laughs> like this no uh, no no just i just i just couldn't believe like why don't they tell people this shit i like i seriously like if you really want people to have children don't you want them to know how like how much it's going to cost the reality of all this stuff but like no they they keep all this stuff from you and then they go you're have- doing society a disservice <laughs> if you don't have children so like I'm not I remember I we were recently talking to someone about about having children and like they were like they want children and I was like oh did you know <laughs> me being fucking autistic or something was like did you know um that having having children costs this much and then he was like what and I was like yep <laughs> yep um and that 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 brings into perspective all our friends who do have children tend to be well well off in, w- more well off than than the average person. They work in Hollywood or something, and we go like, "Well, good for you." <laughs> like you, you have dual income, dual Hollywood income, and that is like the the min- the requirement to <laughs> want to like have children. That's that's a lot of money. <laughs> um, Scrapes you by, I'd say. Like, in L.A. Yeah. In L.A. Yeah. 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 Um, so yes, millennials and Gen Z are they have money anxiety and what is that exactly um it's an actual thing uh there are like symptoms and and things that would probably describe a lot of people you're overly anxious about the future you're worried about basic survival more than normal like it 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 makes it hard for you to live to to think and do anything other than to worry um you feel like you lack control in your life. Um, you, it might, it might, like for me, like it, it was this close to being panic attack esque, but it was, it was like it, you just feel like you lack control. You feel trapped. You feel trapped in the, your situation, and you can't get out of it. Um, you crave stability. Um, any kind of comfort, basically that uh makes you feel like you you don't your anxiety is lessened um you start thinking irrationally um like for me it was like oh i i'm gonna lose my job tomorrow i'm gonna die (laughs) like uh, that's that's and you genuinely believe it like it it sounds like a joke but like when when you're in it you really believe it's gonna happen um and which hence like all these people online thinking and reacting very, very irrationally in in the in a kind of way where like the sky is falling, the sky is falling, um, and then uh, you're if, eventually this results in you prioritizing your safety and uh, over all else, stability all, over all else, and you become really, really risk avoidant. Um, 
and like generally i think people in general are risk avoidant but risk avoidant and like you're not willing to do it, like it, to an extreme level like you're you're it's not normal levels of risk avoidance so like you you de- for me it was like desperately gra- like trying my best to keep a job um or doing whatever it takes to keep a job um hence becoming an overachiever because of my anxieties um and i think this is just this when when you do see it in like social media or everyday life it 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 result it re- it is resulting in people postponing children it's resulting in this weird jealousy of boomers <laughs> who are about to die um it's resulting in fear mongering and in, in people complaining about like the economy in a way that is specifically trying to get you to be scared to get you to to behave in a really fearful way um and i don't think it's a good thing <laughs> i don't think all of this is very good because we've experienced it um i want to i want to anxiety yes oh. um i want to explain uh what it where what i went through i guess so after college um well first of all my my parents being immigrants from china have all have always had money anxiety <laughs> i would liken it to like depression era behavior um so they've always saved money like crazy they've always been like like really really worried about money where like looking back at my childhood i would say we were like middle class in terms of like wealth but i felt poor <laughs> because my parents were always talking about their money anxiety um they were always like so worried about like how are we gonna afford college for you and and all this stuff so i inherently had some of that like i i have weird hoarding of money tendencies and um weird <laughs> i saw this one tiktok where they were explaining like when you're broke or you grow you grow up broke um you you adopt these habits that you don't know are weird and but like you're never going to get rid of them like uh when you have you reach the end of a shampoo bottle you don't throw it out you put some water in yeah. here or something <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or like you have like some people will cut the the thing open and then like like scrape the, oh the the things out um same thing with like toothpaste like you, you don't throw it out you like when it gets really hard you just like you force more and more toothpaste out and eventually you're gonna cut it out so things like that um i've developed a lot of things like that in in life um so like in college it got really bad for my dad partly because he was like struggling to pay for my college education um um at least from what I knew. So like because he just kept on talking about it as someone like it, it felt like my fault, you know? Like oh, I wanted a college education and my parents are so um I am lucky enough my parents want to help provide it for me, but at the same time they're constantly complaining to me about it. So I I need to do my part in trying to alleviate the anxiety. Therefore, I I developed money anxiety in pro- like in high school actually in senior year of high school junior year of high school i was a like i was desperately applying to anything and everything that would get me some amount of assistance to go to college so um a lot of competitions a lot of uh you know things were like if you win you get awarded prize money um and that's my going down the rabbit hole of like people like Dave Ramsey and people on YouTube that give you advice on like how to afford college um and and a lot of it is like when you're young people will give you money like left and right if you just apply for it um so knowing that stuff I would pl- apply to a lot a lot of that stuff um but then it got really 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 bad um once I graduated college because at that point 
um, my mom had a cancer scare, and my dad was still very, <laughs> very anxious about money. But then, like, the immigrant attitude towards when you graduate college as the first person in your family to graduate college is that, like, you graduated college, therefore you have, like, some kind of cheat code to get, like, this crazy, amazing career. So, like, your the expectation is you need to now just fly, <laughs> be an adult, go get that, that 100k plus a year job immediately from at, right out of college. Um, and that's a lot of pressure. Like, it didn't, I felt like a failure if I had any other job other than the one I wanted. Meaning, like, a normal person, when you graduate college, or period, when you don't have that much work experience, you're gonna work, like, at a Target. You're gonna work at a grocery store. You're gonna work at a Starbucks or something, you know? But there was just so much pressure for me to be the successful first child to go to college. Um, and so I had... But And at the same exact time, though, I was very uncompromising about, like, I wanted to pursue a career in Hollywood. I wanted to make a living with art. And those two things were, were competing with each other. So, like, I, I being someone who was always more risk taker, it, it, be, it became really hard for me to take that risk and continue pursuing the path that I wanted to for myself, which is to get a career in Hollywood, and while also being like, but if I don't, like, I need to risk everything to do it because there's all this pressure. Um, and once I got it, I didn't want to lose it. And that's when, like, I had full-blown money anxiety. I really thought that, like, I'm going to get fired <laughs> for no reason, I'm just going to lose my job for no reason, and I'm going to be broke and penniless, and then I'm going to wind up homeless, and I'm just going to die. Um, and I felt lack of control, like I said, that you normally feel. I, I felt like this intense feeling of like not being able to breathe a lot of the times, um, hence like feeling heart palpitations um and and just like a lot of stress and anxiety about like oh i need to provide for myself i need to do like i without the like i clutched onto my career like it on with some kind of death grip i was like <laughs> and and that i don't think that's healthy and i wasn't able to get over it until I slowly started realizing that, like, I do have control over my career and my my circumstance in life. Um, I felt like once you lose your job, and then once you get over that first traumatic experience of, of losing your job, and then you're capable enough to get your second or third or whatever other opportunities and you're not you don't end up homeless and penniless or you don't die um you start realizing like oh, okay i i have control over it but i think a huge part of me burning out was because of a lot of this these feelings um and that's that's my experience with it what was yours uh, I didn't think a lot about money <laughs> <laughs> growing up. And uh, when I started after graduating, I guess, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm really trying to think, because like my money anxiety isn't as crazy as yours. Um, but graduating, I remember thinking like, I've never, I've never made money <laughs> <laughs> ever. <laughs> Other than like selling and trading things on Craigslist, I've never made money ever. And when I graduated, I was like, "How am I going to do this? This is all. This was all theory until they kicked me out of school because because I'm done and stuff." And I was like, "Okay, well, uh, I'll give it a shot." And I had my first few jobs in in theme park design jobs, and I was I didn't know it at the time because I was just so thrilled with making money. Period. That I was making peanuts, mm. <laughs> like, right. like like peanuts. Um, but I was just thrilled. See, this is how, like, I didn't care that much. I, I was like, oh, this is so great. 
Uh, and then when I realized that I didn't like that job and I wanted to get paid more, I quit that thing and then tried really hard to get into the, the Hollywood animation thing. And I guess that's kind of when my anxieties came because then, you know, whenever you quit something, you try to push yourself to do something different. You're like running on your savings and it's literally like, like, like your time limit. And then I got into the industry and I worked for about like a year and a half in a smaller studio that like paid a little bit more, but uh, not as much as the bigger studios. But still I was happy just to have work and to do work. And I remember looking back at those times, uh, that's when I was probably the last time I was a happy person. (laughs) (laughs) When I was like at that small studio making fucking cartoons that no one's ever gonna watch. Um, that was kind of the happiest in my life because I just felt like there was this upward trajectory and that like I was in control this whole time from from grade school to now like I was in control and then uh, the series that I was on got canceled and uh, midway through production and it didn't even have like its first episode come out so like no one will ever be able, will ever be able to see the show ever and I think that's when I really fell into a pit of anxiety of like I lived my life thinking that I had full control over what I could do but sometimes 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 your producer shows his dick to people and (laughs) uh, ends up in the Hollywood reporter and your show just disappears Um, which is like anybody in the industry will turn their nose up at you and say like Oh, well, I knew that. I knew, I know that, like, you know, I know the dangers of being in the industry. Bitch, you all just, like, (laughs) smoke pot and drink your fucking feelings away or smoke cigarettes or wherever the fuck. We're all just pushing down kind of the turbulent career that we've accepted to, that we've accepted and we continue to be a part of just because of our stupid art pride. Um... And that's what I did. After that, I didn't accept, kind of didn't face my anxiety, face or mourn anything. I just just uh, did some drugs and alcohol and everything was a okay <laughs> <laughs> for a time. And then I got into a bigger studio, which I'm at now, and uh, on another TV show. And that was fine. Um, there was a lo- It was my first time dealing with like, Coworker, uh, how do I say it? Coworker, uh, conflict and annoyances. But I knew that was part of the job. I knew this would happen sometime. And it wasn't necessarily the money I was worried about at this point. I was just kind of traumatized. I didn't accept though. I, I was traumatized about how little control I have in this industry and how the reality is I'm just going to have to keep looking for work no matter what until I just croak or quit or retire. Uh, And that was weighing on me, but still I was like, alcohol and drugs, baby. (laughs) Save me. (laughs) Push the feelings feelings down down with alcohol and drugs. (laughs) Um, And uh, that show ended. And then I got like all the, all the, PTSD came back again but then I got into a bigger show into the studio and I was very thankful for that but I was still just so scared but I would fight the fear with drugs and alcohol (laughs) Um, and then right when I wanted to quit drugs and alcohol I basically almost did I I did in uh, the, the beginning of the year 2020 I put all the drugs and alcohol away and I was just like I think this could be it for me. The show seems stable. Mm. Life seems pretty good. Uh, this this might be really good for me. Now would be a good time to like kind of face myself and <laughs> and do all of the kind of self therapy that I've always wanted to do. But something happened in 2020. <laughs> it's called the Great Pandemic of 2020, and that just made me relapse and do more drugs and alcohol and. Van Loo and ice cream. 
<laughs> yes. Lots and lots of Van Loo and ice cream. So I was drinking, doing drugs, and then <laughs> and then like stuffing my face because I like, couldn't go out. I was really upset. I didn't know when the when my last day would come. And the fucking and 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 they all said in the TV and the Fauci that that everything was dangerous and I well, masks, no masks. But the, what I don't know, I don't know what to believe. So so then everything became really difficult, and then the work part got tricky because it felt very strange acclimating from working from the office to working from home, and I wasn't sure about how to do any of that other than to be really annoying or or just I don't know anxious. And then whenever I'd uh, kind of try to take care of my anxiety I'd get like an email from work that I have to do something and then it would raise my anxiety and then it was just a really anxious time for me and and that's this is when you were you when you quit too yeah. so I was just <laughs> I was like oh it's all up to me now <laughs> drugs and alcohol baby um and that was kind of uh where I was at until I moved to Prescott and even when I moved to Prescott I was still very anxious about everything and and still burying myself in drugs and alcohol because I never faced the root cause of the problem which is that I actually don't have a lot of control especially if I work in in the industry in the animation industry no one really does and um, everyone pretends that they have some sort of semblance of control or they tell their students that it's it's no big deal that it's like this, but it's a big deal. Everyone is dealing with it and coping with it and lying to themselves in their own way. Everyone. Yeah. And um, these days, I've I've finally set out to do what I've always wanted to do before the pandemic. And my God, it's ridiculous how much um, everything you push down. And then like, fair warning to everybody in the industry listening to this. For every time you push something down with whatever vice that, that is your choice, there will come a day when you will feel like a responsible human being and go, I'm going to drop all of the, the things that I do and I'm going to try to kind of re rehabilitate myself back into the person I once was before all of this. Everything that you push down is going to come and eat you <laughs> and you will be swallowed and consumed by it for months and there's nothing you can do other than face it face it yeah. and complain and and journal and do all the things um for me for the first i'd say month and a half of getting clean i was getting the shakes <laughs> <laughs> i was getting um intense anxiety other some people feel this thing called anhedonia which is a kind of detachment from reality and the severe it's it, it's yeah it's not it's kind of a flavor of depression where it's like nothing that you do makes you feel joy you basically depleted all of your uh, dopamine reserves mm -hmm. uh, which is what happens when you quit smoking drinking drugs sex fapping to to whatever video games, anything, video games, you're any, anything to. you're addicted to and everybody's addicted to something um and then it's been a real journey to kind of figure out ways to quell my mind and to keep the dread from swallowing swallowing me up which is like a, almost an everyday battle for me at this point i'm 53 days clean <laughs> i'm counting Yay. the days marking off the calendar and it's getting a little bit better the shakes are like not as severe anymore the anxiety comes in waves and i want to say i think there's more good days than bad even though like in the beginning there were like tons and tons of bad days and uh to quell my anxiety i I've been, I haven't taken a hot shower in like 40 days. 
I've I've been taking a cold shower every. Have I been taking a cold yes. shower? Yes. <laughs> I take like I'm obsessed with taking a cold shower every single time I need to take a shower every morning, and it's actually saved me a lot of time. Usually I turn up the hot water and then stay in the shower and then contemplate my life for 30 <laughs> minutes. Now I I get into that va- like vasal constriction kind of like fight or flight high adrenaline thing for two whole minutes and it feels great i feel great after it um i do breath work i do my best to meditate to at least three 30 minutes minimum um one hour maximum i've been writing music i've been reading and all of those things make it sound like it's easy to just like overcome your anxiety but like it's 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 constant for me like though i do these things there are mornings or spaces in between where i'm really anxious about about dying (laughs) about leaving you about you being alone and me not being able to be there to help you um what it's like to die all of that stuff uh but yeah i think that is my relationship with not just money anxiety but anxiety period and the 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 takeaway for me even though i'm still really early on in my recovery is like the first thing is to take it day by day um and to not expect too much too fast because um it's really easy to fall into the trap that Um, I'm going to have the shakes forever. I'm going to be anxious forever. Uh, But I do my best to take it day by day and to not expect too much because that's when I get more anxious. And then the next thing is to know, to to control what I can control, which is like my well-being, what I put in my body, uh, all of this stuff. But then also uh, to acknowledge that there is so much that can just derail everything and there isn't really nothing that you control can control beside beyond yourself um only how you prepare for it and things like that so uh that's been really helpful because i'm at this point where it i i have to have this delusional belief that like no matter what happens i'll figure it out and if whatever happens happens then uh, my 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 the only solace i'll take is that like i did everything i could you know Mm -hmm. and that's like kind of the best as me as a human being could do that like you do your best despite economic strife despite health problems whatever whatever it is um and at the end of the day you'll know that as long as you put in as much as you could put in that's 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 enough and then the third thing is it was something like um i forgot what the third thing was but yeah that's sort of my relationship with it now and uh i'm really um how do i say it just like shocked that how far i've come even though it's been 53 days but uh i'm i don't know i just i i don't know a lot of the, a lot of the times i do just feel just like blah <laughs> <laughs> in sobriety <laughs> but it's it is very comforting to know that that like i'm trying as hard as i can i think that's the difference between well you and me but also like men and women men just want to push it down don't you see they don't actually want to face things they're just gonna put a band-aid on it with like litters and litters of of whiskey (laughs) or whatever your choice of thing is for me sometimes it was food (laughs) for both of us actually um but like i think for women uh you think about your feelings a lot more and you can face them which oh oh the third thing being grateful oh yeah right waking up in the morning 
going like, oh, there's Janet. And then opening the curtains and saying hello to the deer <laughs> and the chubby, tubby birds and, and watching, uh, paying attention to uh, what you call it, the, the, the plant life and the nature and everything and, and the sky and everything. There's this like video because I, I would get really depressed and watch um, people the age of 90 right before they die and their <laughs> regrets and what they want <laughs> to just like wag their finger at the youth or whatever. And like there was this one video I saw of this philosopher, 90 um, something at the end of his life, at the end of the video that was dedicated to him. I, I, I assume that he died soon after. Um, he was you know talking about what it's like to be at the end of your rope and the end of life and missing his wife who passed before him and all this stuff and then he gets to this point where he like talks about how lately he just sits around and looks at the trees and looks at the birds and looks at nature which he never really took great care in looking at before and kind of lamenting that like he's never really he's lived so much life but he's actually never lived really um and i keep thinking about that because us as artists um i remember a time where i would look and study and paint uh nature and uh but look at it from a very objective uh i need to be good at this because i want to get a job at xyz but but now i look at the world and I look at life and go like, I can't believe I'm a part of this. Mm. I can't believe I'm a part of nature. I can't believe I'm breathing the air that I'm breathing. Um, I can't believe I know what it's like to like sit down and paint a lot of these things or, or draw or, or understand why light behaves the way it does. And I'm, and it's one of those small things that when you your your head finally clears up you go like holy shit there's like so much to life and there's so much to be grateful for um that's right in front of you it doesn't have to be some grand like event like getting married or having your first kid or whatever there's so many small moments in life that are just as beautiful i'd say like the birds and 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 just you know it's ridiculous to say but yeah looking at the sky looking at looking at plant life and, and yeah it's just given me an appreciation for for every day that i that i live so mm. i i'm i'm happy about that part yeah i think for me it was similar like there's this overachiever to cabin in the woods pipeline that I've noticed um, I because of the content that I create and the content that I like I get served a lot of people who have given up everything and moved to a cabin in the woods whether it's here in the United States or if it's in Canada or Europe or wherever um, a lot of people are doing this and the people who are doing this tend to be exactly like me <laughs> They usually have had a really stressful career, a really stressful life in the city, and then they burn out, and eventually they just go, fuck it, I need to go live in a, in a cabin in the woods. And I think all of us who have done it understand it's not, there's nothing magical um, necessarily about the woods or, or living in a cabin in the woods. It's the, like... It forces you to be grateful for the little things, mm. um, whether you want whether you want to or not. I think for people like us, you we do need to be forced into it. You know, it's hard when you're living in the city and you're you're high strung and anxious about whatever it is you're anxious about to be grateful. Wall to wall traffic and yeah. the only wildlife you have are flying rats shitting on your car. <laughs> You, you you don't like it when it rains because it smells like piss. Yeah, it's just it's just awful. And there's what is there to be grateful about? Like it, it, there are a lot of things, but when you're in it, it's very very hard to to imagine what those things are. But then when you're here, um, or places like here, like even worse, and like 
it snows every day, <laughs> and you you become really grateful when it doesn't. You become like super thankful for things like the sun, or or being able to like go outside and. And then when you experience things like just deer that just walk up to your window,、um, or like birds you've never seen before because I don't know it's too noisy in the city for them to exist. All you see are pigeons <laughs>、yeah. in the city. Just just flying rats,、um, and it, it 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 forces you to be grateful and present. It it, it makes you like really just. It's kind of stupid to say, but like it really. Some days you just look at the sky and you go like, "Wow, it's really blue," and like, and you really appreciate it, like really appreciate it.、Um, and I saw this one TikTok where this guy, he, he, I guess he had a really stressful career job, and then he quit it so that he can pursue his what his dreams or whatever. But currently he's like working as a server, and he's like. He 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 said he what hadn't been happier than that moment in time to just be a lowly server, enjoying his days off, and because he was like before on a Sunday before he would have to go into work he'd like freak out, he would be so stressed about this or that have all this anxiety, but for once, <clears throat> for, like the first time in his adult life he was just happy he was just grateful. For for the the small the smallest things to just be able to like walk around and I was like good for you that you were, you were able to find that while living in the city meanwhile like, while someone like me had to like just remove myself from society in order to find that for myself、um, and I think when you are going through anxiety and you're kind of depressed. I think there's a tendency to be really jealous and really envious, and to hate on the boomers and the Xers, or, or on somebody, somebody, anybody. anybody who has more than you.、Um, when like, and, and the last thing, the last thing when you feel that lowly, is, you want to hear is for someone to say, "Well, you should be grateful. <laughs> you should manifest." Your destiny. You should have a gratitude journal.、Yeah. Um, but every fiber of your being is rejecting that notion that you should be grateful. When like literally that that is what you need though. <laughs> that that is actually what you you need to tell yourself that you need to somehow find a way to be comfortable and present and 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 happy with whatever it is that you do have.、Um, And and I guarantee you, it's the only way out of your anxiety. It's the only way out of your whatever anxiety or depression you're feeling.、Um, as for actual solutions to the problem, <laughs> I think humans will find a way. I I I have an optimism that does not exist in most people, but I think be. The economy, or like the boomers stealing all the wealth, and the millennials not having children. Oh, AI will solve it. I don't know. So we will figure out a way to to save the olds from dying a terrible, lonely death. Like I think, human beings have always found a way <laughs> to figure it out. And I just believe. I just believe we will find a way. Outside of that, you have no control over that. And it happening anytime soon, so you might as well just be happy where you're at. What are we recommending this week? We are recommending Wim Hof's breathing technique for beginners.、Uh, I gotta tell you, man, cutting people like Tim Pool from my life has been just the best thing <laughs> in the whole world. <laughs> Instead of Tim Pool, you know what I do? What do you? I listen to Andrew Huberman, man.、Yes. <laughs> I listen to Dr. Eckberg, man,、mm -hmm. and I do Wim Hof breathing, man. My God, I've been learning so much about health and wellness, and and fasting, and OMAD, and time restricted feeding, and and cold therapy, and heat therapy. And and all of that, and it's been just like man, I, it makes it makes me for the first time really like just regret like having listened to fucking Tim Pool <laughs> for for that much of my life. I could have just been listening to Huberman Lab, just like figuring out how to be a more well well wellness 
whatever person. And um, the thing that I do uh, every day without fail is this uh, breathing exercise from the great Iceman Wim Hof, who uh, is a amazing human being. A lot of us will never be as amazing as this human being who climbed Mount Everest in his chonies, basically. <laughs> um, can be submerged in uh, under ice water for for a long from for a long periods of time while retaining their body heat. And this, you know, a lot of people call him a guru at this point. He is a guru, and uh, he practices this thing and promotes this thing called the Wim Hof method. And uh, this breathing thing that I do, I do it every day, which is basically there's three parts to it. There's a part where you basically induce kind of hyperventilation. You breathe in really hard, as hard as you can, fully in, as he says, and then you let it go, as, as, he, as he says. And then you just do that for at least 30 to 40 times, 30, 40 repetitions, no breaks in between. You just breathe really hard. And then you hold your breath, you exhale, you hold your breath for, uh, for different intervals of time, you can go from 30 to a minute to a minute and a half. And then as soon as you're done with that, you uh, inhale again, and then you press into your chest or into your head for 15 seconds. And then you do another interval, another kind of set. Um, uh, and it's it's helped me a lot. It's it's really just ridiculous how I, I my, my breathing has gotten a lot better. My, my lung capacity has gotten a lot better. I never thought I'd be able to hold my breath for longer than 45 seconds, and now I can hold my breath for a minute and a half, and I'm trying to get to two minutes. Um, and it's really exciting because uh, it's there's just something about it. I think the first few times I, I listened to it, I br- broke out in tears, especially when Hoff goes at the end, he goes like, all the love, all the power. And I go like, oh my God, I have no power, but this makes me feel like I have power. This is so great. Um, so I do a set of Wim, Wim Hofs, which is, there's a, a, a there's tons of videos, tons of videos in every language of a, of a Wim Hof breathing thing. And then af- immediately when I'm done with that, I do like a 30 minute to one hour meditation where I just put um, headphones on and then put like ambiance sounds of waves and I just think about nothing for 30 minutes and if i think about something i just kind of push it away push it away push it away softly so if you are suffering from anxiety which a lot of people do um you can go about it in any old way you want you could do drugs you could do alcohol but man this wim hof stuff it's really great i highly recommend this wim hof stuff it's it's just um, it's challenging and don't worry if you can't hold your breath for a minute and a half yet you will you will if I could do it <laughs> if I could do it I never thought I'd be able to do it but if I could do it you could do it too for sure for sure if you like this episode make sure to like subscribe you can go all our bells and buttons check out these other episodes to binge all our other episodes and we'll see you next time bye